Perfect. So thank you all for making time. Steve Trachtenberg, gosh, a number of people. I won't greet you all by name. Luke Phillips, welcome to everybody. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. We have a fabulous writer scholar with us today from Boston College, Ryan Hanley. And we have my colleague, Michelle High, who do the honors of introducing the topic and Ryan. She will moderate the conversation and then there will be ample time for questions and comment. We'll have a hard stop at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thanks again, Michelle. Welcome to you, over to you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Hi, everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, just a reminder up front, please feel free to put questions in chat and I'd be happy to call on you directly if you like uh, when the time comes for questions. I am so pleased to be joined today by Ryan Patrick Hanley. Ryan is a professor of political science at Boston College. I happen to know him by way of the University of Pennsylvania back in undergraduate days when we were starry-eyed students of the Enlightenment expert, Alan Charles Coors. Now Ryan is the professor with the starry-eyed gazes coming toward him. Uh, he's a world-renowned Adam Smith scholar. He's a scholar of the Enlightenment more broadly. Um, previously, he was the Mellon Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Marquette University. He's the author of a number of books, including Adam Smith and the Character of Virtue, Love's Enlightenment, Rethinking Charity and Modernity, a terrific non-academic book meant for everyday living that we'll discuss today, it's based on Smith's theory of moral virtue. So our great purpose, Adam Smith on living a better life. And his most recent book is on the political philosophy of Francois Fenelon. Ryan, welcome. Uh, thanks very much for having me. It is a great pleasure to be here. I'm really grateful, Michelle, to see you again. I, I, I especially enjoyed the reference to our, uh, well, I'll say my wayward youth, our time way back then. You were surely much more responsible than I was back in college. <laughs> So we're gonna get Ryan's take on what Adam Smith and other enlightenment thinkers had to say about the virtues needed to live a good life. And then we're gonna get more interestingly into the virtues needed for a democratic society and which ones might be under particular strain today. So Ryan, could you please help us set the scene here on Smith? How is it that capitalism is synonymous with selfishness and materialism in most people's minds when its founders so clearly emphasized our natural sympathy for others and the importance of seeking happiness? What has gotten lost in translation over the years with Adam Smith? Oh, that's a great place to begin because that goes right to the heart of the matter. Uh, um, what Smith said and what people attribute to him are very different things. And um, for that in part, I have to say I'm grateful. That's what keeps people like us in business as scholars, uh, as trying to set the record straight. But of course, there really is a significant political question at stake here. Uh, that, um, and I think the direct answer to your question, how is it that capitalism became known as X and why did Smith get associated with it? I think it's very complex and it goes into questions that have to do with reception history. But I think the easy way to get one's head around it is um, quite simply, Adam Smith never discusses capitalism. Capitalism isn't a known phenomenon in the 18th century when Smith wrote. He publishes The Wealth of Nations in 1776, that important year. And uh, uh, it's not a word that's in common discourse. That word is coined and used by Marx and by many other uh, followers of Marx, who of course are criticizing an economic ideology that, uh, that uh, uh, they, they resent in many ways. Um, Smith himself understood himself to be defending something different, uh, both in terms of the word he used as well as um, substantively what he wanted to defend um, is very different from what Marx was criticizing with, uh, with capitalism. So Smith's own term uh, is the term commercial society. When he describes what he's defending, he's uh, defending something called commercial society, sometimes called market society. Sometimes he simply calls it the quote unquote system of natural liberty. But he defends that for very specific reasons and on very different grounds from the ways in which capitalism in the 19th century and the 20th century and beyond came to be understood both by, one has to say, its detractors, Marx and his many followers, but also by some of its defenders, some of whom um, conveniently find small areas in Smith that resonate with, uh, with positions they want to defend, um, but aren't always interested in doing the hard work of looking at um, both of Smith's books and how they add up to a coherent, uh, and I would say indeed moral system. So I think that's the, the, the place to begin. The real Smith, uh, the complex Smith, the Smith that was defending something called commercial society, 
is I think ultimately much more interesting and speaks to our moment in ways that go beyond sort of the, the, the demonization and the championing of capitalism from uh, the extremes on either side right now. Yeah, it really does seem that the moral side of it, the moral perspective on it has been lost. Um, and you say that sympathy, it lies at the heart of many enlightenment thinkers take on virtue and it's also key to Smith's thinking. Can you talk about sympathy for a moment? Sure. Um, so Smith, uh, I mentioned that he wrote two books. So uh, the book that most of us know today uh, by popular repute at least is The Wealth of Nations of 1776. But Smith was originally employed as a professor of moral philosophy at his alma mater, the University of Glasgow. Um, and his first book back in the 1750s, he published a work that came out of his classes on moral philosophy called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And so that's published in 1759. And Smith takes literally as his point of departure in that book, the concept of sympathy. And he begins the book by making not a normative observation, not saying what we ought to do, not talking about virtue, but simply a claim about uh, who we are, how we're hardwired. And he says that we have within us this thing that he calls sympathy that naturally leads us to be interested in other people. And the wonderful first line of the book, um, Smith begins the theory of moral sentiments by saying, quote, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature that interest him in the happiness of others, even though he should get nothing from it. Uh, and that is, I think, a fascinating way to throw down the gauntlet. From the very beginning, Smith says, yes, we're hardwired to be self-interested, but that's not all we have within us. We have this thing that leads us to uh, be interested in feeling what other people feel, in thinking what other people think. And in fact, in that first sentence, this remarkable statement, we in fact care about the happiness of others so much so that it's quote unquote necessary to us. That's, I, you know, there's a tremendous amount packed into that first sentence, but I think that idea that we have within us this natural principle of sympathy that leads us to care about others, to care about their well being, and to consider their happiness as in some deep sense connected to our own. That's a really fascinating point of departure as an empirical statement about what we are, what we were made to be. And it also, of course, has profound uh, implications for what a healthy and flourishing um, society, both a market economy and a system of moral norms and political institutions. And of course, it's that that Smith is then going on to develop from that very interesting and pregnant opening line. But I think that's what it comes down to, the idea that um, we're hardwired, uh, provided we're not corrupted or malformed or shaped by certain perverse social forces. This is something we care about. And um, that unto itself, I think, opens up interesting roots for discussion about the world in which we live today and whether in fact sympathy is a, um, shall we say, live phenomenon in our current social and political moment. Well, I know we're coming back to sympathy and perverse social forces. So <laughs> let me just ask you one or two more questions about Smith's thinking before we return to that. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of interest in questions about that. So where uh, one of the concepts that you talk about is action. Um, you quote Smith saying, man was made for action. So industriousness is clearly a good thing. It brings us rewards, it brings rewards to society. But where does he draw the line when it comes to money, making money, seeking the attention of others? Where do those cross the line from being positives to being negatives? Uh, that's a great question. And I think Smith spent a lot of time wrestling with this. And I've spent a lot of time trying to wrestle with what Smith was wrestling with here. And, you know, here's one I, I said earlier on that Smith occupies sort of an interesting middle space between sort of pro capitalist and anti capitalist uh, positions today. And here's one place that I think he's really subtle and interesting, which is his views on self-interest and pursuit of what he called bettering our condition in the marketplace. Smith thought that this was the desire to make money, to be recognized for one's money. He thought it was undeniably a good thing. It's a good thing for human beings insofar as uh, it helps us provide for our natural needs. It's a good thing insofar as it helps us by acquiring certain amounts of goods, we become recognized for these things. It prompts our incentive, I should say it incentivizes us 
to act in certain ways that's healthy for us, meeting our needs, healthy for our families and our societies, meeting their needs, and indeed healthy for economic growth uh, as a whole. It's a good thing that this desire to be recognized and to better our conditions exists in us. But there's an enormous but here. Smith also recognizes that it's good to a point. And after it uh, passes beyond this point, it can quickly become very bad. And he describes this in a variety of different ways. I think one of my personal favorite, one, one thing I always, when I teach the texts, I always um, spend time with my students. Smith tells this wonderful, essentially a parable. It's a story of, uh, he calls him, quote, um, the poor man's son whom heaven in its anger has visited with ambition. And it's a story about an individual who really wants to get ahead, who really wants to make a buck, who really wants to climb the ladder of esteem and success. And this is a good thing to teach to ambitious undergraduates, all of whom are thinking about what comes next. Um, and one thing that you see in the story of the poor man's son that Smith wanted to convey is that in many ways, what he does is good. It's precisely that that generates the universal opulence that gets distributed by the invisible hand. That's good for everybody. But the same thing that generates these remarkable material gains also comes, especially for this poor man's son, at a significant moral cost. In trying to climb the ladder, what does his life look like? Smith goes into great detail here. He's always working hard. He's staying up late. He's always trying to impress his superiors. As Smith says, he's obsequious to his superiors. And so he gets really consumed with thinking about his image, thinking about how he comes off, thinking about what he can do to impress people. And the result is he runs himself ragged and he lacks what Smith calls the tranquility in which real happiness consists, or at least what's necessary for, for happiness. So we've got this remarkable paradox of on the one hand, the pursuit of self-interest and the desire to be recognized and esteemed, a good thing for individuals and for our society. On the other hand, too much of a good thing is a very, very bad thing and becomes a moral ill very quickly. So one of the things I think Smith is trying to do is to define what's that middle inflection point. Um, he certainly didn't want to kibosh the entire project of individuals pursuing their self-interest. He's much too good an economist to think that that would be a good thing. But he also was too good a moral philosopher to think that giving in to that would be a, a healthy thing. So I think as a uh, philosophical economist, he's interested in defining that moral stance, that moral middle point. And he does that in a variety of ways. One of the most interesting to my mind is his discussion of the virtue of prudence. And this is really somewhere where the rubber hits the road for our contemporary moment. He distinguishes the difference between what he calls inferior prudence and superior prudence. On the one hand is the prudence of the people who are always pursuing their self-interest, always trying to um, make big gains fast, taking big risks, and can't think of anything else but that. On the other hand, there's a better kind of prudence, people that are playing the long game, people that aren't trying to make risky short-term big gains, but trying every day through hard work and industry to uh, be a little bit better than they were before. That allows them at the same time, not just to pursue their self-interest, but all kinds of other goods. The prudent person rightly understood turns out to be a good business partner, a good friend, a decent member of their community. Now there are people that will say that the prudent man of that sense is you know, some sort of boring bourgeois. And that's a critique that I think is legitimate and should be pursued to some degree. But, as, um, but it helps get to that idea that the prudent man rightly understood is the perfect example. Somebody who is pursuing their self-interest, but in a way that's healthy for both themselves and for those around them in their communities. Let's take up the boring bourgeois because let's move into it. Let's move into democratic politics now because one of the most serious charges against classical liberalism, and it's something that Francis Fukuyama has readily acknowledged in his foundational article for American Purpose, is that it does not comprise a view of how to fill life with meaning, the higher ends of life. So does Smith's version of happiness, which as I understand it is a combination of industriousness, tranquility, self-mastery and serving others, does his perspective incorporate a higher purpose in life? Oh, what a great question. I'm so glad that you asked that because I know that's on the, on the uh, I mean, so many of us are thinking about this today in this interesting moment for classical liberalism or simply liberalism. Um, 
we're seeing no end of critiques on both the left and the right that are dissatisfied with what liberalism has to offer. And I think that one of the critiques, certainly foremost among them, is what you point to, Michelle, this idea of um, meaning. And, you know, I, I read these critiques uh, both as a modern, as a contemporary citizen, as well as a Smith scholar. And I suppose my first instinct is to say, well, I wish these people had read more Smith. And I don't want to say that Smith is all the answers, but I will say that Smith anticipated and he's not alone. There are a number of other founding fathers of liberalism, and I think Tocqueville would probably be the other one that I would point to. If you wanted a short list of readings of far-seeing thinkers who anticipated our current moment and worried about the concerns of liberalism and especially the threat that it posed, poses to meaningfulness, I would say Smith and Tocqueville would be good guys to start with. Because one of the things I think that one finds in both Smith and Tocqueville is a robust, comprehensive, uh, deeply, uh, deeply nuanced defense of the genuine goods that a modern democratic commercial order founded on self-interest can bring, but also a deep sensitivity to the ways in which things can quickly go awry. And um, Tocqueville, anybody that's read the last chapter of Democracy in America knows that he's worried about the potential future, the loss of meaning, the loss of greatness, a loss of the appreciation of the noble. But uh, Smith, writing the century before, 75 years before, Smith understood these questions, I think, very well at an incipient point when the market is emerging. Smith was a good enough student, in fact, a profound student of antiquity and a very close reader of Plato and Aristotle and Cicero and the Stoics. And he had a real reverence for one of my favorite phrases he uses again and again is the honorable and the noble. And that's no, certainly not the side of Smith that we associate with the invisible hand and the pursuit of self-interest. But he thought that fundamental to human beings was a longing for that which is noble and a desire to help realize that which is noble and honorable in real life. Now, the noble and the honorable are very complex. Uh, there's a long history to this in moral philosophy. They're very complex questions in Smith. And I won't, I won't bore the audience by getting too far into the weeds of the, of the history of ideas here. But suffice it to say that Smith recognized that commercial society, at the same time that it brings these great gains, has the potential to threaten this. So I think much of Smith's project is to develop a virtue ethics, a theory of morality that does justice at once to the real benefits of the pursuit of self-interest, but also seeks to preserve in hearts and minds a reverence for what is transcendently good beyond simply bettering our condition, what is good absolutely, and indeed good in the sense of the honorable and the noble. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask one more question that I think will set us up for some questions from the audience. And that is looking at the virtues that are strained in our modern digital world. I wanted to ask you, which virtues do you think are particularly difficult for modern politicians to adhere to? And then which do you think are most strained among the, com the average citizen? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. And I hesitate here as, you know, tenured ivory tower professor to wag my finger at those, uh, at those, uh, at those politicians. I know that they have to run for reelection and they have to raise funds and all that kind of stuff. But um, I don't think it's any secret that our world challenges certain virtues, both politics and society, and especially the age of digital communications. Maybe the easiest way to get into it is simply to say, I mean, from Smith's perspective, Smith understood there to be um, essentially four cardinal virtues. Uh, prudence, which I've already mentioned, benevolence, um, self-command, and justice. And I think a good case could be made that um, we do well to recover all four of those, but in an effort just to get to the question as quickly as possible. I think on the one hand, um, certainly our digital age has challenged uh, uh, I would say self-command uh, in particular. Um, we have all kinds of incentives to indulge uh, in certain types of behaviors now. Um, one is the rush to judgment. I mean, anybody that's been watching 
prominent politicians' Twitter feeds in the midst of the GameStop scandal, we'll see that very complex ideas are being judged in black and white ways remarkably quickly. And these are, I mean, infinitely complex ideas. And so obviously um, a bit more self-command would be helpful there in terms of how we present ideas and engage in public discourse. Also, you know, and on the level of the average citizen self-command, you know, it sounds like a fuddy-duddy virtue in certain ways, but, you know, we need it. Um, I, I saw a comment, uh, there was an interview with the founder of Netflix um, who was asked apparently, um, who does he see as his, or who or what or does he see as his chief competitor? And he answered very quickly, sleep. I, I, this idea that we have these temptations that are almost impossible to resist, but it's very necessary for us to moderate and resist uh, in a world that gives us so many opportunities and indeed a marketplace that gives us so many opportunities for gratification. Smith himself was one of the first to say, uh, we need to have some sort of, uh, of capacity to be able to resist these and to be able to recognize which are undeniably good for us to indulge in. I'm sure Smith would have watched a little bit on Netflix, but um, that there must be uh, limits and boundaries, oftentimes self-imposed rather than waiting for others uh, and especially uh, political powers to impose those on us. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, the first question we have actually comes from our own Robert Bork. Robert, would you kindly uh, share with us your question? Hi there, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, it's good to see you again. Uh, my question is, so there's this, there's this disagreement about whether Adam Smith can be rightfully called the father of modern capitalism, um, because he certainly described the emergence of commercial society, but he by no means used the term capitalism. That was something that came up much later on um, after Smith had already passed away. So my question is, can we look to Smith as an authoritative source for an idea of completing or modifying capitalism, the system that we currently have? Um, is there, are there truths in what he wrote to be rediscovered and that we can incorporate into our own contemporary political economy based on the fact that he certainly described uh, commercial society, but he was not self-consciously aware of the term capitalism? Yeah, that's a great question, Robert. I appreciate it. Um, that, I mean, you go straight to an issue that I think is naturally on the minds of many people today, which is, so what can we get from Smith? What do we stand to gain from turning to Smith? And I think that there's something, there's two ways of looking at that. I think one is actually pretty dangerous and the other can be really healthy. So the dangerous way is um, when we look to great thinkers of the past, as if they have easy and pat solutions to our present problems. Uh, I, I was um, a, a wise teacher of one of my wise teachers. I remember being quoted as saying that um, only we today can solve the problems we face today. There's simply, you know, page 732 of the Wealth of Nations doesn't answer how we should or should not regulate Twitter. Um, so I think that there's a facile way in which we should resist looking for answers to Smith. What Smith, I think, can teach us and what he can remind us of are really several things, but I'll focus on one here. And that's the basic question of what we look to an economic order to provide us with. And Smith, I think, has a unique perspective there. Um, you know, for many generations, the modern social science of economics has focused on um, questions, uh, models based around maximization of utility. And Smith, of course, contributed to some extent to some of those models. But Smith, as I've mentioned before, was first and foremost a moral philosopher who went on and saw as a natural outgrowth of his original project in moral philosophy, the social science of, of political economy. So these were not two different enterprises for him. In some very deep sense, economics and well-constructed economic systems are moral enterprises. And I think he even went further and believed that there was something, a specific moral good to be found in well-constructed economic systems. And that was the good of poverty relief, point blank. When Smith mentions the invisible hand in the theory of moral sentiments, when he begins the opening introduction by the fourth paragraph of the Wealth of Nations, he's made quite clear why he thinks market orders deserve our allegiance. And it's not just because of increased efficiency, though he thinks that that's certainly true, but also because they serve a very specific moral end. 
And that is an alleviation of the material conditions of the least and lowest so that um, the poorest among us are able to lead lives of decency and dignity. That is a way I think of talking about economic systems that um, uh, I think our contemporary political discourse can benefit from. And I think to be blunt is a nonpartisan way of understanding exactly what we might stand to gain from arranging economic institutions in certain ways. I think we're in a really interesting and creative moment right now where we're rethinking because of challenges on both the left and the right, a lot that um, people like me that grew up in the eighties associated with capitalism. Something new is going to come. And what that new thing is, I have no crystal ball, so I won't try and predict. But I hope that a recovery of um, a basic consensus about the moral gains that we can stand to uh, achieve through certain economic systems. I hope that stands at the front and center of our discussions. And I really do think that that perhaps more than anything else, if I were pressed to say, why Smith now? It would be that to remind ourselves that economics is fundamentally at the end of the day for Smith and indeed still for us, a moral enterprise. Thank you. So we have a question that's come in. What are the key differences between Smith's concept of sympathy and Rousseau's concept of pity? Oh, this is a good question. Um, uh, I spent a few years trying to trying to figure this one out. Um, uh, oh boy, I could get too deep in the weeds here quickly and start quoting chapter three from Hanley's 2017 book. I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm guessing this came from specifically an academic audience that knows their uh, 18th century moral philosophy. On some level, both pity in Rousseau and sympathy in Smith play exactly the same role. These are what we might consider today other directed sentiments that lead us to be concerned with the interests of others. Um, at the same time, there's a really fundamental difference. And there's a reason why Smith, who was deeply influenced by Rousseau, who translated passages from Rousseau and who wrote after Rousseau, there's a reason why Smith, I think, used the word sympathy rather than Rousseau's word, pitié or pity. And that is that I think Smith recognized that there is something at least potentially condescending in the language of pity. Um, that pity suggests some sort of hierarchical, and anybody that's used the language, I pity you, um, uh, or has heard that language, can recognize instantly how condescending that can be. Smith is much more interested not in the moral feeling that comes from the good feelers to the sufferers down below, but he's interested in the interchange and exchange of feelings within, uh, within social interaction. So I, he actually, I think, very consciously used um, uh, the language of sympathy to sort of, in some ways, take out a little bit of that hierarchical balance from the beginning. And you see this, if you, I, I quoted earlier in the opening comments, um, that first line of the theory of moral sentiments, anyone that wants to see how Smith makes this shift should go back just to the first two paragraphs of the theory of moral sentiments. Smith begins with the language of, very explicitly, pity. But then he shifts to the language of compassion and to sympathy. And he's really interested in sympathy in particular because of um, what's built into the very term that's different from pity. Sympathy, I mean, for those that you know, have a little bit of Greek will know that the word comes, I mean, it's literally derived from the idea of feeling with, sympathia, in the same way that the Latin cognate compassion, feeling with. And I think it's that idea that Smith is so interested in, not feeling for or feeling towards, but really feeling genuinely with, actually trying to experience what another person is feeling as they're feeling it, not having in any way, even benevolent feelings, but feeling like you have certain feelings or experience something from your position fundamentally different from what they feel. So I, I think that that's, I mean, it's a little bit of a linguistic detour into the you know Latin and Greek derivatives, but I think that's really the force of Smith's idea that it's a two-way street and a real effort to meet people where they stand on their level rather than anything that could be seen as hierarchical. Thank you. That was from Flag Taylor. I, I didn't see video on, so I didn't call on him, but um, same for Ron Smith, who has a question. Um, Ron, you're welcome to turn your video on and ask it directly. Would you like to do that? If I don't see you do it, I will just ask it myself. <laughs> 
Okay, so Ron's question is, much has been made about the influence of wealth of nations on Hamilton's manufacturers and even on Madison with the constitution. Given that Smith worked for 17 years on wealth of nations, was his timing of its relief release influenced by the start of the American revolution? Meaning conversely, was the revolution, did that influence him? Yeah, there's no doubt. And I'm so glad that you asked this question that um, this semester at Boston College, I'm having the great pleasure, inordinate pleasure of teaching a new course. And the course bears simply the title 1776. And I'll say the same thing now that I made the disclaimer to my students on the first day. I came with this course five years ago. I was intending to teach this well before uh, the 1619 report of the New York Times or the Trump Commission 1776 report, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is something about 1776 that transcends our current political moment, though it's having a rejuvenation. But I mentioned the course because I really did want to anchor it by teaching the wealth of nations published in 76 um, around the other concepts of liberty that are emerging in 1776. We're reading Paine this week. Next week, we read Price. After that, we're on to a whole host of other thinkers, some very well known and canonical, like Smith and Gibbon, others uh, somewhat less known today, um, the remarkable Boston poet Phyllis Wheatley and her wonderful ode to George Washington, uh, and indeed even a uh, 18th century London playwright, Hannah Cowley, who wrote uh, a hilarious play. Um, uh, 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 I, I won't get into the weeds here on that, but all of these thinkers, I think, I mean, it's such a remarkable moment for political philosophy in addition to the politics of the colonial separation from, uh, from the British Empire. Um, what I think binds them all together is a common interest in the concept of freedom, and of course binds the founding fathers, people like Madison and Hamilton together. Um, you know, Hamilton and even Madison, like when you look into Madison's second presidency and the bonus bill and the concerns with uh, economic and infrastructure improvement. All of that bears a very Smithian stamp insofar as um, these ideas of what the developing burgeoning nation needs to develop. Uh, Smith's sections on public works, I think, are very important for understanding, uh, and this comes out in book five of The Wealth of Nations, uh, uh, the course of the politics of American economic development and a bit of the framework they were working with. Um, but also at the same time, it, it's a two-way street. Not only did Smith shape some of the ideas of the Americans, but the Americans helped shape some of Smith ideas, Smith's ideas. And he was deeply aware of the, I mean, given the circles he hung with in London, how could he not be aware of what was happening in the American Revolution? He was uh, deeply sympathetic to the colonial cause, not least of which because of the economic inefficiencies of trying to keep uh, it wasn't in Britain's interest to keep this uh, far-flung commercial empire and the colonies there. And Smith had direct reasons to know of what was happening in the colonies, um, uh, not least of which Benjamin Franklin came and visited him uh, on more than one occasion. Um, and there was even for a long time an apocryphal story, I don't think it's true, but that uh, Franklin read some of Smith's um, uh, drafts of the Wealth of Nations and may have made some revisions. There's some really interesting comments about Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania comes off really well in Wealth of Nations uh, that some 19th century scholars wondered if that might have been Franklin's invisible hand at work as it were in Wealth of Nations. I don't think it's true, but it's all a way of saying in direct response to the, to the good question that um, Smith understood and was thinking about the practical politics of the uh, move towards independence and recognized its benefits. And he himself also went on to influence the, the new nation. So I think that there is a deeply American connection to Smith that goes beyond simply the perhaps happenstance fact that his book was published in that, um, that Annus Mirabilis of, of 76. Terrific. I've got a question from Livia Mann. Livia, did you wanna turn your camera on and ask it yourself? Uh, and if you don't, I will ask it. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Sure. Hi, Professor Hanley. Thank you for speaking with us. You're welcome. It's good to see you again, Livia. <laughs> um, so you've been discussing how we can use Adam Smith to think about creating a more moral economic system. But I think my question lies in that we have such a global economy right now in this economic system where the largest actors at play don't 
have a shared concept of morality and don't really seem to have any kind of shared valued system. And yet for a moral economic system, people would have to agree on what morality is. So I think my question would be, does Adam Smith include any ways to think about that? That would seem very <laughs> uh, predictive, but do you, do you have any ways to think about that? I, I, I appreciate the question and it's great to hear. I mean, maybe there's two ways of thinking. I think you're absolutely right to think that, I mean, we live in a globalized marketplace, we all know this, and that there are many conceptions of morality that work across the world and even in our own culture and that oftentimes these are at loggerheads. Absolutely agreed, important point of departure. But maybe there's two ways to think about morality. Are we trying to come up with um, the highest moral good that we can all agree on? That's unlikely to ever come out anytime soon. Or is it possible that there are specific moral ills and evils that we can generate genuine consensus on and that might transcend individual uh, moral uh, uh, ideologies? And I think it might be in that direction that Smith might give us the most to go on. Um, especially with regard to global commerce. Um, I mentioned earlier, and I'll stand by this, I don't think that Smith easily tells us how to regulate international financial institutions. Um, but he does, he was writing at the time when some of these were beginning to emerge, and especially on the level of global commerce. One in particular was I mean, arguably the most influential uh, uh, global economic institution of his day, the British East India Company. And Smith writes a scathing critique of what the British East India Company was doing. And particularly the way they were able to leverage their special interests and their ties to uh, the British government to be able to not only monopolize uh, commercial routes, but also to exercise remarkable amounts of political and military force and judicial force um, outside of any sort of concept of political legitimacy. There was economic power when they went to the lands in which they went to trade and they used that power to do what were some pretty objectively awful things. Smith points that out. And I think one of the things he wants to recognize and have a see in terms of the morality of that situation is not in any way how global commerce in that sense affects some sort of grand moral good but the fact that there are certain identifiable, reprehensible moral harms perpetuated by that particular unification of political and economic power. And these things, I'll use a very reductive term here, these things are bad and we can understand that they're bad and we should recognize when they're happening and take whatever steps we need to do to avoid them in the future. One of the things we can do in Smith's conception is of course separate and not allow economic power simply to give leverage for political power and to understand that there have to be divisions between these two things. But to your question, which I think is a really good one, especially at a time of tremendous moral disagreement is that the proper point of departure isn't to try and unify around a conception of the good, but to begin, as I think all the great liberal political philosophers of early modernity started and tried to do, begin by trying to identify the moral evils we should ameliorate to start with, and this is one of Hobbes's phrases, right? Not the summum bonum, not to try and achieve the summum bonum, but to identify the worst of all evils, the summum malum that we should be always guiding our policy by trying to avoid and exploitation of that sort was foremost among them in Smith's mind. Thank you so much. So we've got a question from Luke Nathan Phillips, please. Uh, Professor Hanley, on that, uh, that very last point you made in uh, answering Olivia's question, um, there's been a resurgence uh, of, uh, of economic thought and political economy uh, explicitly focusing on class bifurcation uh, in modern Western societies. Um, there's been a resurgence in Marx influenced conservative thinkers like James Burnham uh, and even some of the early neocons. Um, things that uh, Adam Smith uh, didn't, uh, didn't know about, probably uh, couldn't have foreseen if he tried. And so my question is, uh, if somebody were to try to reconstruct Smith's moral philosophy of political economy into an explicitly uh, class bifurcated and partly technocratic era such as our own. What do you think? Uh, what 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 do you think the main avenues of questioning 
would look like in that front. And, uh, and I understand Smith has usually been interpreted in a more specifically egalitarian sense uh, rather than a class bifurcated sense. So what would that look like if you were trying to transpose it to modern issues? Okay, that's, that's great. Uh, I would say in the first place that um, I think Smith was sensitive to some of the bifurcation worries that, that you note. Um, I mean, you have to remember that he is of course writing at the very cusp of the emergence of a modern commercial order. And um, he knew well the legacy of uh, the feudal order and the sorts of, I mean, what we think of today as the 1% uh, and the 99%, the elites and the rest, this is, I mean, Smith lived this world. He only had to go into the highlands to begin to understand, or even lowland Scotland with land ownership to know that. So he did welcome commercialization for, as he thought, breaking down some of these um, potential worst of all bifurcations between the extremely elite and the rest of us. Now, one could, um, and I think legitimately say to Smith, um, perhaps there was too much optimism there. Perhaps he wasn't able to anticipate the ways in which over the development of several hundred years, we may have recreated some of these class bifurcations. And indeed, we all know in terms of questions of economic mobility that um, these have been solidified in ways that I think would have troubled Smith. The question then becomes what to do about them. And of course, we all know that there are a lot of different solutions on the table from both left and right. The guidance that I think Smith can give us would be this. I think Smith agrees that radical bifurcation and extreme inequality is a real and genuine problem. In his day, and certainly I think were we to bring him back in 2021, he would not deny that. I also think that he would be amenable to certain sorts, and this is where we can get into, I think, all kinds of questions about the how, but I think he would be amenable to certain ways of alleviating that particular concern. But what I think he'd most want to tell us is, whatever steps one takes to alleviate inequality today, make sure you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. That is to say, the original justification of the market system and Smith's vision is the way in which not it alleviates inequality, but the way in which, as I tried to signal before, the way it alleviates abject destitution and poverty. Smith's advice, I think, point blank would be, whatever one does, and many things can and should be done to address the contemporary problem of inequality, make sure that one does not disturb the engine that has gotten us where we are, and has enabled us to make these remarkable gains in the alleviation of global poverty. And that's simply, you know, I, I think Smith would welcome the tremendous achievements that we've seen over the past several hundred years that have brought us to this uh, stunning point where the UN's number one development goal for 2030 is the eradication of global poverty. The very idea that one could even think that thought Smith would be, I think, very warmed as a moral political economist that that's even a reality. So um, we've been on the up and up on that front, even as equality has been, uh, has been uh, also increasing. Whatever one does on the inequality front, and I am not the one to, to, to give those policy solutions, and I don't think Smith is either, but I think his guidance is to make sure that we don't hamper the engine of poverty relief at the same time we try to address legitimate concerns about inequality. Excellent. We've got a question now from Mark Tan. Mark, you ready? All right, I can ask Mark's question if we don't hear him jump in in a moment. Mark, are you there? Oh, Sorry, I uh, was having some technical difficulties. Um, yeah, Professor Hanley, thanks for the uh, talk today. Question for you on what you think would be Adam Smith's view on some of the monopolists today, like, like Amazon or Facebook, especially in light of how critical he was of the East India Company. And do you think you'd be in support of breaking them up? So, you know, this is one of those moments where, as a general principle, I think one would have to say, that worried greatly about monopoly. I mean, this is one of the foundational principles of the wealth of nations. And he believes that anything without uh, market access is specifically bad, uh, not just for small business, but especially for end users and consumers. 
So um, I can't tell you whether Smith would, uh, you know, what he would tell uh, Tim Cook and Bezos and all the rest, but I can say that um, the heuristic that he would put before us is, are the interests of end users genuinely well served by uh, these conglomerations that do seem to have centralized a remarkable degree of power and don't seem to be allowing for uh, fruitful emergence of things from the bottom up as we've seen in other periods of, of, of growth. So I think that you know, if, if Smith were to testify before Congress, he wouldn't say, hey, go do this, but he would say the measure by which we should be analyzing this is not simply the scale of corporate profits, but precisely the way it's affected uh, consumer behavior and consumer choice. Excellent. I've got a question from, excuse me for a second, Shai Marriott. Would you like to ask your question or would you like me to ask it for you? Give you a second. All right, so I'm gonna ask it. How capable did Smith think we were of transcending our self-love and focusing on love of others? I believe he thought we were very capable. Um, you know, the language of transcending is interesting. Um, Michelle, you mentioned at the outset that I just wrote another book on this guy, Francois Fenelon. And um, Fenelon was a fascinating figure. He was, uh, he was, uh, the, well, he was the author of the most read book in all of 18th century France after the Bible. He was the court tutor to the grandson of Louis XIV, and he was educating the, um, the potential heir to the French throne to be the anti-Louis XIV. And Fenelon, and I mention this now because Fenelon was fascinated by the question of transcending self-love. That is, he was also a Catholic archbishop and he was engaged in the biggest theological debate of his day, which was a famous debate over pure love. That is the idea of whether human beings could in fact achieve a wholly disinterested love of God that was not tainted at all without any, with, with any love of self. Fenelon actually got into somewhat hot water from, from, from the church and from the Pope and from the King. I mean, he was really sort of managed to run a foul against everybody. But um, Fennell, at the end of the day, was a spiritual author that thought this was possible, this sort of transcendence, and that it was a legitimate goal for human beings. I think Smith's a little bit different. I think Smith genuinely welcomes and admires, reverences individuals who are able to manage their self-love and to um, transcend its worst and most pernicious forms, the sort of vulgar egocentrism that, you know, we all, I've mentioned Twitter enough times to say that, yeah, you know, log on to Twitter and you'll see it there. But um, he didn't necessarily want to create a society of saints. I don't think that he even thought that would be economically desirable. Instead, I think he wants us in many ways to educate, to elevate our self-love so that um, without denying our natural self-interests, we also come to a full appreciation of the interests of others. And that's a really demanding moral task. Um, Smith likes to use the language of, and he uses this, I was editing the theory of moral sentiments, I realized he uses this very language three times in his book. The idea that we need to come to appreciate the fact that we are quote unquote, but one of the multitude, no better than any other in it. That's really, a, I think a fascinating moral challenge, right? He's not telling us to give up our self-love. He's not telling us to be abjectly humble or not value ourselves. He's not even telling us what Fenelon tells us that we have to have a quote unquote annihilation of our self-love. It's good to think decently of oneself, but the challenge is to do that at the same time that we're able to see the full humanity and appreciate the full value of everyone else among us. I mean. That I think is a wonderful moral task and a wonderful challenge. I, I challenge my students and myself sometimes to say, try walking down the street and believing that you are just one of the multitude, no better than any other in it. Um, it's not an easy perspective to sustain, but um, it is what Smith thinks we have to call ourselves to do if we're going to live in a healthy, flourishing democratic order in which we both pursue our own self-interests, but recognize that every other one around us has the equal right to that. Thank you. All right, I've got a question from Natalie Smallage. Smallage. Natalie, would you like to ask that yourself? 
Okay, so Natalie's question is, does Smith have a say on religious or civil institutions shaping virtues like prudence? Is a renewal of the moral purpose of capitalism possible without a religious civic strengthening? Okay, so here's one of the questions that keeps Smith scholars up late at the pub and fighting uh, in friendly discussion, uh, maybe I should say, is the question of Smith's understanding of religion and indeed religious institutions. Um, it should be said that those aren't entirely the same thing, especially vis-a-vis -vis the questions that uh, the questioner raises regarding virtue. On one level, Smith genuinely worried about religious institutions and the way in which they could corrupt virtue. Um, you know, in, um, uh, in a very famous set of passages in The Wealth of Nations, Smith talks about the need for religious liberty. And the argument that he gives for that uh, is that we don't want any one religious institution to get too strong at the expense of others. There, it might have a certain hold on hearts and minds that could be salutary, but it could also be corrupting. And so in the 18th century, there were great worries about what they called superstition and enthusiasm, which are small code words for Catholicism and uh, Protestant evangelicalism. And um, extreme forms of those genuinely worried Smith. Uh, he argues for a multiplicity of religious sects and religious freedom that will create that because he thinks that these, if they balance each other out, can have desirable effects. If one gets too dominant, say there's a national or established church, Smith thinks that they can have, uh, they can really stifle uh, uh, certain ways of thinking. But if we have a multiplicity of sex, they'll be actually in competition with each other. You see the market model that Smith uses all the time emerging here. And uh, that will serve to moderate their, uh, their uh, different expressions. Um, we've been talking about some of the connections with the American scene and anybody that hears in that um, something like um, Madison's arguments in Federalist 10 about the multiplicity of factions and parties balancing each other out, it's good to hear that. As a matter of intellectual history, we know that Madison was influenced by Smith's arguments here. But, um, the, the key idea here, I think, from the standpoint of the place of virtue and religion is that Smith thought that some religious institutions, a, a national church that had a monopoly might not be so healthy, but moderate, smaller religious groups, especially those that um, allowed individuals to interact with each other, that had a salutary eye on their behaviors, uh, that gave them freedom of thought and expression. Smith thought that these were very good things and thought that in fact, the desire to be religious was natural to human beings. He talks about the natural sentiments of religion. That's a very interesting phrase. And it's one that um, I think Smith was invested in and believed us to be naturally religious beings. But he also, and he thought that that was a good thing, but he also understood that that could take healthy forms or perverse forms, depending upon the institutional culture. And so in the issue of religion, I think he does something that he does with a lot of other institutions, which is ask, in what ways can we dis disaggregate a well set up series of institutions that give rise to what's best in human nature versus poorly set up institutions that might pervert, corrupt, otherwise distort certain uh, natural impulses. And I think religion is a perfect example of that. So the, so the sort of the short answer is yes and no. Religion plays potentially a very salutary role, but it can potentially under the wrong sorts of institutionalized formats play a really pernicious role. Thank you. And we have a question from Edward Murphy. Is that one you want to ask yourself, Edward, or shall I ask for you? All right, Edward Murphy's asking. Well, he refers to his favorite observation of Smith's that a man of means in Europe laments reading about many deaths of the Chinese, but he wouldn't lose sleep the way he would have if he had lost his little finger. So his question is, does Smith believe sympathy can or should extend to distant lands and the distant poor? Okay, good question. And how can we not think about this uh, in an age in which we see, you know, tragedy du jour on our television screens 
and then uh, quickly forget about it once it falls lower in our, in our social media feeds. Um, I think Smith's answer to this is um, one way to get, there, there's a lot of answers to this, but here's the one sort of bumper sticker level uh, response to this, which is um, uh, think globally, act locally. I don't know, is that bumper sticker still on anybody? I don't know if that's still on bumpers anymore, but um, the idea that it's healthy and good to think about the well beings of distant others. To some degree, Smith thinks it's natural. It would be barbaric for someone to feel nothing or be uh, indifferent to the fate of people on the other side of the world. But he makes a very conscious distinction between the mere feeling we can have for distant others, which is often fleeting and sometimes superficial, and what we can actually do for local others. And most of all, he wants to resist the idea that it's morally sufficient for us just to have nice thoughts for the suffering of others and not distant others that we can't do anything about and allow ourselves to become complacent and indifferent to the things that we can do things about. You know, there's different, like Dickens satirizes this in some of his philanthropists in his books, but Smith was well aware that sometimes that sort of, you know, moral pat on the back, oh, I'm a right feeling person. How good am I to feel pity and compassion for distant others? That just doesn't cut it at the end of the day. And he wants to move people to act. Um, I mentioned Smith's use of language is great. And one other place he does this, and I won't again try and get too deep in the weeds of his Latin derivatives, but you know, he makes a very conscious distinction between benevolence and beneficence. And the difference between good willing or good feeling, benevolence, and actually good doing beneficence, practical action that actually makes a difference. It's pretty clear that Smith values the latter over the former. The former has a place. It's decent and human to feel humane feelings. But at the end of the day, it only takes us so far and it shouldn't be allowed to supplant other things that Smith would like to see, which involves a form of action and behavior. Thank you so much, Ryan. We are getting very close to the end here. I had one person ask that if there was a Smith quote you want to leave people with, because you, the, 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 uh, it was Shai Marriott who said that you had mentioned some quotes that were deeply relevant to today. And is there one quote you want to leave people with of Smith's? Sure, I, I, I use, uh... Smith is not a riotously funny guy, uh, but uh, every now and then there are moments of humor. And um, uh, especially since we've been talking about such heady things, um, I'll leave you with one quote that is on uh, the other side of the spectrum here. Um, and we actually have this from uh, not his published text, but his uh, uh, the student notes. We have his undergraduates wrote out longhand notes that we found from his law lectures. And at one point in time, one of his students was jotting down and says that Professor Smith said, man is an anxious animal and occasionally needs something that will sweep away his spirits. Uh, uh, well, he turns out to be talking about booze. <laughs> it's in a discussion of, uh, of liquor taxation. And he has a really interesting argument about perverse incentives with, uh, with uh, taxing luxury goods. But he also understood, and I think it's just a wonderfully humane moment that um, Smith recognized that we're complex creatures and that uh, every now and then we need to relax a bit. And so I really like that side of Smith. I should have given you something profound and heady, but uh, I'll just leave you with that. Smith speaks to all sides, I think, of the human experience. Uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, I, I, that student may have interpreted that to say, um, uh, oh, Professor Smith says that we should go out for, uh, for, for a long <laughs> evening. Um, Smith also teaches that stuff about self-command and moderation too. So I'd be remiss if I didn't say that Professor Smith, I think said, um, yeah, go ahead and have a drink, just one. Just one. Well, Ryan, I think what the quote shows, like you said, is the relevance of Smith to today and his down to earth way of looking at things and across the centuries, he, he still speaks to us. Thank you so much for being here. I know Jeff wants to say a word, Jeff Gebner wants to say a word at the end as well. So, so Michelle, thank you. My, my word is thanks to, to you for beautiful management and leading this conversation, Michelle, and for all you do as managing editor of American Purpose. And Ryan, we I know your work and we have friends in common, but it's the first time you and I have met, so to speak, by Zoom. But what a splendid conversation. Uh, my final thought, Ryan, framing thought in, in conclusion, 
Um, I had an investor say to me once, a successful investor, a uh, investor worth something around three billion U.S. dollars. Uh, he said to me, "You know, I find I get stuck all the time in my investment work, and when I'm stuck, I always have to expand the data set." And why do I say that? I, I think when nations and societies get stuck, and it's my own view that we, the United States, are stuck. The manifestation is Bernie on the left and Trumpism on the right. But I think we're stuck in some ways. And I think one way to unstick ourselves, if that's proper English, is to reach, to revisit, to listen and learn from history, economic philosophy, moral philosophy, to jog us, to stimulate us, to, to provide new or different or a mind of even older perspectives. In any case, you've done that in one hour beautifully and I enjoyed it greatly. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Michelle. And for everybody who took time from busy days and many Zoom conversations, thanks. Glad you were with us. Much appreciated. Thank you both, Michelle and Jeff. I really appreciate all you're doing and this invitation. And it's been a joy. I really appreciate the audience. Uh, and uh, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye.